and 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 I've always said I'm I've I'm I've always been in a struggle with religion mm-hmm. and God because I, I I I know that there are more of them out there, but I I think I'm this close if I'm not already there to being a a, a black atheist. <laughs> I, mean, I, I just I don't know that I believe no, in no, God. No, there's I, a black atheist. Yeah, I, I, I don't I, I haven't completely crossed over. But I'm like Anakin Skywalker. I'm I'm so close to the dark side uh-huh. that I'm I'm starting to feel like my faith in in, in religion and humanity, uh, and what this all is supposed to mean is a bunch of bullshit. Really? Yeah. Faith and humanity. Yeah, yeah. Because well, it, it doesn't make sense to me. Because I hear you know, and, and and listen, I know for a comic, one of the most challenging things to do is to try to do material that's deemed taboo mm-hmm. and risque. And one of the biggest challenges that I want to take on is to be able to go in front of a black audience and say, I don't believe in God, which is blasphemous because we in the black community, like Richard Pryor said, black people, we tight with God, you know, um, (laughs) and I just don't understand how we as a people historically put so much faith into this thing called God. But yet for 400 years, we were in chains. Mm. For 400 years, we prayed for 400 years. Black people have a saying in church where we go, the pastor comes out and he goes, Uh, God is good, ain't he? And we say all, all the, the time. time, all the time. God is good. All the time. 400 years, all the time. The 60s, all the time. The four black girls that died in the church bombing in Alabama, all the time. The nine black people shot by Dylan Roof in church, praising God. You would think if the, if the one place you are safe, mm-hmm. a safety zone is in his house, and if God and the angels can't protect you in his house, all the time? Give me some of the time. Okay. But not all the time. God is good some of the time? And I don't listen, and I don't know whether God is black or white, but here's my thinking. Let's just say, okay, God is black. Mm-hmm. And people, you know, slaves are praying and, oh, my Lord, 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 Lord. Mm-hmm. Freedom going to come one day. Well, freedom is inevitable. We weren't going to stay slaves forever. So you mean to tell me 400 years later, finally being free, now we want to go, he might not come when you call, but he's always on time. <laughs> if 400 years is on time, that's tardiness. So if God is real, he's a nigga, because he's late. <laughs> and uh-huh. if God is white, you putting all your praise into this white God who clearly didn't give a fuck about you either. Mm. So which is he? Is he black? Is he white? If he's black, why wouldn't you look out for your own people? If he's white, now you showing love to this figure who kept you locked up. None of that makes sense to me. And you say you haven't totally crossed over? No, be- <laughs> no, no, because no, because I, I look at things. I look at things like when I travel, and I've been all over the world, and I look at certain places, and I look at the beauty of certain things in terms of the earth, and mm-hmm. and, and and just animal and nature, and I go, it's got to be a god. Right. When I'm when I'm when I'm when I'm when I'm and certainly when I'm in some pussy, I go, this gotta be a god. <laughs> this feels so good. <laughs> but then I pick up a newspaper. And I read how a, a four-year-old girl gets kidnapped, raped, and murdered. Now, I know they say God gives man free will. If God gives man free will, okay, I get that. But like the mafia, women and kids should be off limits. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing more terrible. I, I, have, I have three kids. I have my youngest daughter is five. Love her to death. I couldn't imagine what it, might be, what it must be like for a child to feel the terror mm-hmm. of I'm losing my life. Where's my mother and father? Yeah. Someone help me. And if God can't step in at that moment and go, look, I know I give man free will, but this is a kid. Thank you. All bets is off. Thank you. So I don't, I don't, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. Right. This, too much of, the, of what goes on in this life does not make sense to me. I don't know if I'm overthinking it. I don't know that because I'm getting older, I start questioning my own mortality. Mm-hmm. When you're young, you're arrogant. Yeah. You think you're going to live forever. You think you're going to look like a movie star forever. Yeah. You, sh- you know, you, your shit don't stink. You're the baddest and the best in the world. Uh-huh. But the older you get and your back starts hurting and you make a noise when you get out of bed and you know, what's this pain on my knee? And you start questioning your mortality and you realize through being humble, uh, shit is weird. It's just yeah. weird, man. Yeah. Speaking of being young, you started comedy <clears throat> at 14, but you were on Def Comedy Jam at 16. Yeah. And... Do you, 
I have so many questions about that moment. Yeah. Because you looked so confident. I think, and we all, if if you were Def Comedy Jam fans, you have to have remembered Ari Spears being on Def Comedy Jam. Maybe. I did. I absolutely remembered your jokes, okay. without a doubt. Uh, and the Michael Jackson bit just blows your mind. And the, oh, you know, the cartoons fucking, like yeah. that, I, I can't forget that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, so my questions, my first question is, take me back to that moment and how you felt as a 16 year old getting on the stage with those comedy legends who are, I'm sorry, now legends, right. but then they, you know, everybody was kind of you know trying to funny? make uh, it. Back before they finally did away with uh, DVDs, and, and record stores. I remember I was in a record store and they had the best of volumes of Def Jam. And I, you know, you can go on YouTube and watch, looking at some of the old Def Jam performances, Bill Bellamy, Bernie Mac, uh, you know, Cedric DL, myself, Chappelle, Eddie Griffin. And I don't even remember how long ago it was until I look back at clips and I right. go, damn, because you was about 150 pounds lighter. Yeah, yeah, I was also I was I, like, damn, I, was it that long? I was 16, yeah, that long ago. <laughs> um, but when you look at everybody's set and everybody's energy, you could see the rawness. Like Bill Bellamy, I was, I was messing with him, that's my man, because we came up in Jersey together. I was telling him, every other word out your mouth was, yo, that's crazy, right? Right, yeah. We just all had this <laughs> nervous energy, the way we worked the stage, cut to where we are now. We're like jazz musicians. Mm. Everything is cool. Yeah. And it ain't a put on, it ain't a front, like we trying to be cool. But we've, and I don't want to say mastered the art because you're always trying to evolve, but we've gotten comfortable in our skin. Mm -hmm. So before where it was nervous energy and, yo, that's crazy, right? And saying the same thing over and over, now it's sit back, play the music, let it flow. Yeah. And you work and you find your rhythm and you're not so antsy. Um, but my mother's a jazz and blues singer, so she mm -hmm. got me into the industry, thank God. Um, and she sang with Lionel Hampton, the legendary wow, that's jazz huge. artist before he passed. Um, so growing up, I listened to a lot of that John Coltrane and, mm -hmm. and, and Miles Davis. And my, my first impression actually was Louis Armstrong, because that's what my mother and father would listen to when they would be fucking. So, Wait, how, so, did, how do you know that they were having sex, uh, though, Because whenever they played Louis, the door would rattle. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, was the door rattling from the music, or was the it door both, rattling because your daddy was getting both. in? Both. My daddy was a monster. <laughs> but I, I knew what I heard outside the room, potato, potato, you say tomato. <laughs> Let's call the whole thing off. I said, Pops is getting it in, man. It's getting it in. Yeah. So take me back to that moment, though. How did, how, do you remember your feelings or, of, of being backstage waiting for your turn? Not really. Um, it was just all su surreal. And, I, and, I've, and I've done this in interviews before, and I'm going to do it again. You know, I know that Stan Latham and Russell Simmons get a lot of the credit for Def Jam. Because yeah. they're the guys whose basically names were on the bill. But the brainchild and the, and the genius behind Def Jam that gave all of us our starts was Bob Sumner out of New Jersey. Had it not been for Bob, because Bob planted the seed and brought it to Russell and to Stan. So had it not been for Bob, a lot of us would have never come, come to be. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I mean, not to take anything away from Stan and Russell, because whatever it takes to get it done, we get it done. But Bob deserves some credit. What happened between 16 and Mad TV? Between that time, what was happening? Between 16 and Mad TV were the good years. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was young. I, I, I made a lot of money. Um, and I was trying to come into my own. Um, I, was still, I, I was still a young child who hadn't been diddled yet by his uncle. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, and when I, say I don't that, even know if I'm supposed to laugh and, at that. And, and I mean, when I say that, I mean oh. the industry. The industry oh, I is know what uncle. you're talking about. Yeah, so, <laughs> but, so but, but, when, you, when you first come into this business, you have a certain amount of naivete. Yes. And there's an innocence about you because you don't know shit. Mm. Um, and because then, at the time, you all did Def Comedy. You were on Def Comedy Jam. They weren't paying the comedians, right? No, they paid you, but oh, it okay. wasn't, it wasn't going to change your life. But that's not why you did it. Right. You know, you did it for the love of the game and, you know, to, to get your name the and exposure. your face out there yeah. and the exposure. The rest will take care of itself. Um, but, yeah, I, I, you know, um, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a wild time for me because I came into this game without anybody schooling me. Um, my mother only knew so much because she had only went so far, and music is a different beast from comedy. Right. My father wasn't, he had dreams and aspirations of show business, but he never did it. So I was the I was kind of the 
the first one and only one in the family. I, I was the first one to ever B buy a TV. house and, oh. you know, come in, hit the 50% tax bracket right. and, 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 and make that kind of money. You were um, making that kind of money at 17, 18 years old? I made over a million dollars before I was 21. You know, because back then, they gave you what was called holding deals. Mm -hmm. So the networks, they don't do them anymore, but back then, they would give you X amount of dollars to take you off the market and lock you up for a whole year to Much try like to create... Much like the record industry, you know. I guess so, yeah, but, they, but to try to create a show for you. Yeah. Um, and for like five years, I, I, I went through every network. I went through ABC, NBC, ABC, Fox, uh, maybe four, four years, where they just locked me up, and, but nothing ever came about it. Right. So it was like every time I had a holding deal, I had 200000 so they were 200,000, 200,000, 200,000. Um, so after all the holding deals, you know, I made a million dollars, but I never had anything to show for mm -hmm. it creatively. Um, so it was, it was bittersweet, you know, because you make that money, but then it's like, you know, the real money is in an actual show. Yeah. Syndication, producing, you know, not just starring and dancing the dance. I will, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, I... We kind of, sort of, have Mad TV in common. Okay. The only difference is you landed the gig and I didn't. Uh, oh, you auditioned for <laughs> I auditioned for Mad TV Did you really? four times. Is that right? Four times. Okay. Um, and I was going to ask, how'd you get it? Like, I wanted to know the secret, but obviously it was the impressions, don't you believe? Well, and that and some timing. Uh, the first time I actually auditioned for Mad TV, the very first year, I couldn't do it because I was locked in a deal with uh, Fox and, at that time, Aaron Spelling was doing a show, uh, well, no, I, I was locked in the deal with Fox, but we couldn't get nothing going. And by the time my deal was ba basically about to be up, Aaron Spelling had did a pilot. Aaron Spelling was the creator of Beverly Hills 90210. Right. The man. The man. Yeah. Uh, so he came up with a show that was basically like the Mod Squad. So I did that pilot. It was called Crosstown Traffic. It didn't go anywhere. But the president of the network at the time, Peter Roth, was such a fan of mine. He said, look, I don't want to let you go. I know we were supposed to give you your own show. We never really developed it, but I want you on this network. So he went back to the producers and said, <clears throat> put, him on, put him on Mad. And by that time, Mad TV was going into its third season. So I didn't even really audition for Mad TV the second time. They just went, we wanted we you the first time, it. and now time and fate has done its thing, you on. Oh. Yeah. Look at God. <laughs> <laughs> I, do you, how do you feel when people say, because Mad TV was, when did you rap? 90, I don't remember what, offhand. Mad TV was quite some time ago then, we can say 20. Well, it was on for 14 years. Okay. Well, you weren't on it for I 14 years. I was on for years. eight. Okay. Yeah. Um, and people love to say, he fell off. <laughs> do you believe you fell off? You know what's funny to me, is the people that tell you they fell off, where are you at? I mean, I, I've, I'm in the 50% tax bracket. I got Still two, to this day? To this day. And, and to this we, day? To this day. And if, you, and if you did a total on my yearly income, I have two commas on my check. To the people that say I fell off, how many do you have on yours? I've been to Africa twice. I've been all over Europe. I've been to Australia. I've been to Dubai. You know what I mean? I don't, when I, and I'm not bragging or boasting. I'm right. just trying to put this in perspective. I don't remember the last time I've ever had to wait in line to get into a place. Most times I go, people off love go, Aerie Spears, my man. Boom, drink, on the house, food, on the house. And, and every now and then, I get some pussy. <laughs> a lot of it. So, fell off a to lot what? A lot don't sound like every now and again. Well, I, regardless, okay. fell off to what? Mm. Like, what, do you, what, is, what is falling off? Like, like <clears throat> I, 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 I'll, I'll go next year and go, I, I got a show in Dubai. I'm making five figures mm -hmm. for one show. 20 minutes of work. You sit in a cubicle and you listen to a boss. You don't, you've, you've never pursued your dreams because mm -hmm. most people don't pursue their dreams out of fear and they don't know how. And it's crippling. The worst thing you could do is have a dream and get up every morning and go to a boss and be told what to do. Nobody tells me what to do. So fall off to what? I think when people say fall off, it's because they don't see you. So do you believe that comedians need to be seen or, I'm sorry, entertainers need to be seen in order to be, have a, a certain stature in, in their field? Well, that depends on what defines your happiness. You know, my, my first manager, 
real manager was Norm Nixon, Storm and Norman. Won a couple yeah. of championships with the Lakers. Debbie, Debbie Allen's, Allen's husband. husband. And he always used to tell me, don't let this business define your happiness. You know, I saw, I saw a clip of Mark Curry. I think he was on a Mike and Donnie show. He was. And so many of the people in the comments were writing, oh, he's just mad and he's just mad because he's not relevant. It's like, this nigga had his own show. He makes more doing stand-up than you probably make in a year. F irrelevant to what? You know what I'm saying? Well, what if they're comparing him to Steve Harvey, they're seeing Don't Steve Harvey. <laughs>